have not say hello. Hello, it's good to be back. And uh, we are kind of, I am, no, we are not. I am still trying to get my bearings. And I was there in my office waiting for the Spanish school class to begin and wondering, where is everybody? <laughs> but we have something exciting happening. And um, we know that the heart of the gospel is to tell others, to tell others about Jesus Christ, about what he has done for us. So we believe that having missionaries is important to us. And um, how you show if something is important, right? Uh, sometimes it is by how we spend our money. <laughs> and it is sending missionaries. So we have Brother um, Heppen and his wife. And they're going to be introducing the ministry of um, going to Europe and working with the military. And it's a, it's a ministry that is in... I think that right, don't, don't you feel like this world is ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back? Amen. I feel like that too. And uh, so that and like almost every ministry is in desperate need of someone who, who can go. So we're going to open up with prayer and then we're going to have Brother Heppen come. And uh, he's going to talk about the ministry. And like always, um, we are going to have a question and answer time. So everybody here, you can ask any questions, and um, you will vote on Brother Heppen later. But uh, if you have any questions about the ministry, about the work, um, get ready for that. Brother Heppen will try to answer some of the questions before you ask them by telling us more about, about his ministry. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord, we're so thankful for those who are willing to go. And Lord, we, we're coming today with... Uh, just a heart that desires to, to, to worship, a heart that desires to hear, a, a heart that desires to, to, to serve. So, Lord, I pray you please bless the service, bless the presentation. Uh, we have a lot of people right now that are trying to get stuff ready, and uh, it's easy to become Martha's and just trying to, to get everything ready. And, and, and just, uh, I pray you be with them. Help them bless their work. Thank you for the labor of love, and I pray you help us to... Right now, to sit down and concentrate and, and, and hear the, Lord, the burden that Brother Heppen has for the military, I pray that you give us a burden also to, to share that with others. I pray for, for this, in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Heppen, if you can come, introduce your wife and the ministry, we'll appreciate that. Just surprised him with is a it's a challenge coin. It says it's on, and now I can hear. Now I can hear me. Hopefully you could hear me before too. But uh, thank you, Pastor, for allowing us to come uh, and be here. What I just handed you is a challenge coin. Uh, it's a military tradition. It's a way of showing appreciation and thank you uh, for for having us come. There's a few other traditions that go along with it that we don't talk about in church, but. Uh, the basic part of it is originally the, a soldier who did a really good job uh, in battle would get a specialized uh, coin with the unit emblem and, and inscribed upon it uh, in addition to their, their day's pay that they earned uh, back in uh, Roman ages. So thank you so much, uh, church family, for having us in. Thank you, for Pastor, for calling us in and, and uh, for the wonderful hospitality you've shown us so far. Um, my name is Gary Heppen. That's spelled like the word happen, but with an E, and so we're pretty happening people, or you might know, might, if we were back, uh, back in the, the Carolinas or Georgia, uh, we might say that we were going to help them out, and, and so that's how you can remember who we are and how, how to say it, happen, all right? And uh, with me is my wife, Claudia, and uh, we are missionaries to the United States military, Specifically, we are headed to a place in Germany called Kaiserslautern. Uh, I'll talk more about that in just a moment. We were both saved while serving in the military. We served in the military uh, for 20 years in the United States Navy. I was on board uh, submarines as a nuclear reactor operator and electronics technician. Uh, it's a very stressful job. I would spend a lot of hours away from home, and even when I was home, I'd spend a lot of hours on board the submarine and, and not at home. 
Uh, so my wife had a much more stressful job, a much tougher job, and it's that of uh, the Navy spouse or a military spouse. And uh, she took care of everything without me most of the time. In fact, more than half of the time I would be gone on board submarines during our 20 years in, in the Navy. And uh, she took care of raising two children, both of whom are grown. You'll see them in our video. Um, they're both graduated from Ambassador Baptist College and serving the Lord. And our daughter, the youngest one, uh, just got married to a Marine brother. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that yet. But uh, he's a good kid, but uh, he's still a Marine. So I don't know, being a sailor, you know. So the, be the brother of the best Marine is a submarine. So... Uh, we'll just get that out of the way right now. Um, so, if you didn't catch on, honey, I've already been, I've already met the one Marine. There's always one Marine in the in the in the church group somehow. I don't know how that works, but everywhere we go, there's always one Marine. So, uh, we are we we were saved in 1999. My wife was saved initially uh, in August. What happened was we lived in military housing and. Uh, and uh, our neighbors, who happened to be in the Air Force, in the other side of the duplex that we lived in, uh, they invited my wife to take our children, who were young at the time, to church, to an Awanas program, a kids program. And my wife is not the kind of person to just let anybody run off with our kids, so she went with them to the, started going with them to the kids program, and then eventually she started going on to church with them. And I was uh, working rotating shift work, and I was fine with her going, but I wasn't going because that was the only time I really had to sleep most of the time because I was working these ro weird rotating shifts at, for the Navy. And in August of 1999, she said, I, I want to go back to church tonight. And I'd never heard of that before. She had been going to church on Sunday morning, and she had been going on Wednesdays for the kids, and I was okay with that. But all of a sudden, now she wants to go back to church on Sunday night. I wasn't real happy about it, and I wasn't real kind about it when I responded when I asked her why. But she went back, and she went back early, and she got to go in and talk to the pastor, uh, and he led her to the Lord, uh, and she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior that evening before the service. And then uh, she didn't tell me right away. I don't know why, since I was so nice about when she went back to church that night, um, but I didn't understand. And so... About two weeks later, after she had told somebody else who was really happy for her, she came into the bedroom and told me, and I was laying on my back with my uh, hands behind my head, kind of looking up at the ceiling, and she says, guess what I did two weeks ago? I got saved. And that's about what response she got. Because in my head, I was thinking, great. Now I've got to deal with this Bible thumper. What have they done? They've brainwashed her. What's going to change? What have I got to deal with? Because all these things I did not understand. Uh, what it meant to be saved. What she was even talking about. All I knew was that something was going to change. And it did. And in September, a, music, a men's quartet music group came through and sang at our church. At the church that she was going to. It wasn't our church yet. And... Um, she invited me to come, and I came and, and, and listened, and it wasn't so bad as I had made it out in my head, and I got to meet the pastor, and he wasn't as bad as I got to make it out in my head, and I got to meet some of the people in the church, and they weren't nearly as bad of Bible thumpers as I thought they were going to be. Uh, so I started going to church whenever I could. Uh, it, it grew slowly over the first couple of weeks, couple of months, and then in November of 1999, uh, during the preaching of the morning service, I recognized that I was a sinner bound for hell and that I needed to be saved. And so when the invitation time came, with every head bowed and every eye closed, they were asked to raise our hand if we, want, if we knew we needed to be saved or we needed to be saved. And every head was bowed and every eye was closed except for my wife's. She was peeking. And so, and that's what she tells everybody. I was peeking to see because I wanted him to go get saved. And so when the, the time came to come forward to the altar, I, I, you couldn't have held me down. I knew I needed to, I, I had it straight in my head. I needed to go. So I came down, and a, a gentleman by the name of Nick Burns, one of the deacons of the church, took me around the back by the baptistry and sat me down and showed me from the Bible what it meant, how I could be saved, and I called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. 
In December of 1999, the both of us were baptized together following the Lord and Believer's baptism. And then we began serving the Lord immediately in that local church, although we were only there for about another six months before the Lord and the Navy moved us to our next place. And that's a unique thing about military is we're always moving. And so the longest place we lived was the next place, and then we were there about four years almost to the day. But other than that, every other place we went in the military, we were there less than three years. And we would get involved in the church, and find a church and get in, and plugged in and get involved in the, serving in the ministries as, as soon as we could. And we also ministered to the military as well during that time. So on board the submarine, in addition to being a reactor operator, I had several, I was telling one young man back there in the sound booth this morning, I had several jobs on board the submarine, and one of those was known as the lay leader. Uh, the cha- there's no chaplain on board a submarine, so they have a volunteer do it. And I was the lay leader. I ran the church services underway. I did the Bible studies underway. I took care of making sure we had Bibles and hymnals and tracts and, and, and try to f- find people to come to Bible study and come to church services and, and make sure that we were meeting all the requirements that the Navy had for it as well. Um, In addition to that, my wife ministered to the military for 17 of our 20 years in a position known as a a ombudsman. If you look at the table back there on the flag stand, you'll find a a name tag of one of the submarines I served on, but it's not my name tag, it's hers, and it says underneath her name, ombudsman. So in case you don't know what that means, she was the direct representative of the commanding officer uh, and she had specialized training in all of the programs that the, that the military has for the military families. And every time we would go to sea, there'd be some kind of problem with the families that are left behind, with the spouses or the children. There'd be, there'd be medical problems, there'd be drug or alcohol problems, or even suicide problems, or mental health issues. And my wife was the person that they would come to uh, looking for help or looking for uh, some assistance from the military or whatever. And so they would come to her, and this became her ministry as she helped them through these situations, and the Lord allowed himself to be brought into those situations. She was able to share the gospel with with folks as she helped them through troubling times. And like I said, she did that for 17 of our 20 years in the military. And the last few years of that, she was also training others to do the same job. And so uh, great to have... Her, that experience beside me as we go to minister together to the military. Now we're headed to a place called Kaiserslautern in Germany, as I mentioned earlier. And the reason we're going to that place is the Kaiserslautern and military community has the largest concentration of American military outside of the United States. There are 15 different bases in the immediate vicinity of Kaiserslautern that house some 54,000 troops plus their spouses and their children and the civilians that work alongside them, as well as some foreign militaries because the largest base there is Ramstein Air Force Base and it houses the uh, NATO Air Force headquarters. So there are little detachments of foreign militaries that are part of NATO uh, that have these help to the Air Force planning from each of the countries. So there are some foreign militaries there as well. And so that's why we're going to that particular location because it is, it's such a big place for the military and they're constantly rotating in and out, as I mentioned. In addition to that, we'll be able, since we'll be overseas, we'll be able to uh, reach out to the local nationals, the Germans as well. And my wife is German. She's from about 20 minutes away from where we are going, a little town called Permacense. It used to be a big military area, now it's not as, not as big. Uh, and military-wise, um, but she speaks German fluently in that local dialect, and you wouldn't know it to talk to her today. She does not have a German accent at all, and so uh, her her stepdad was military and brought her over to the states when she was young, and went back and forth, back and forth, and then finally settled in Indiana, where I met her uh, when she was in about the eighth or ninth grade, and then I took her back to Germany in 2004 to 2007 when. We went there on Navy recruiting duty, and I went to steal away all the Army and Air Force kids from all the bases so that they could join the Navy. Um, 
And so we're excited to go back to this place. There is a military church that is there already named excuse me, Rhineland Baptist Church in the town of Lawnstool. Lawnstool is right across the uh, Autobahn, the interstate, from the Ramstein Air Force Base at the kind of the western end of the Kaiser Slaughtern area. It's in the village, uh, which is at the bottom of a mountain, and at the top of the mountain is the Lawnstool Army Regional Medical Center. It's a, it's a big army hospital where they, they uh, treat all of the wounded from the war zones uh, before they send them home or send them back, either one. And so when we were stationed there, we lived on that base, and we would see the helicopters come in with the wounded uh, landing at the helicopter pad that we could see right out of our place. And, or, or we would go walking around for our medical appointments in the hospital, and we'd see the wounded laying on gurneys uh, waiting to be treated in the emergency room in the, in the hospital. And so this area is very heavily military, and it's very close to our hearts, having been saved in the military and having served in the military. Now, I want to give you some information about the military uh, missions itself. Uh, this church that we're going to go work with, Rhineland Baptist Church, is a church plant, military church plant, that has been there over 40 years. Now, you might look at me and say, why is it a church plant if it's been there more than 40 years? And it's because the people are constantly rotating in and out, as I mentioned, because of the military. So normally a missionary will go uh, some, uh, to a foreign field. They're going to go, first of all, on a survey trip that lasts just a, just a few weeks to a few months to try to figure out where God would have them plant a work and start a work. And, well, we've well, already been on a 20-year survey trip in the military. And it's, it's afforded us some advantages. Usually after the missionary goes on the, uh, on the survey trip, they come back, they raise all their support, coming around to local churches just like yours, and tell you about your ministry, their ministry, and then they go back, and then the first thing they're going to do is go to language school and learn the local language. Well, we already know the local language, and it's not necessarily English. And our, our friend uh, back there could, from the Marines could tell you that Military speaks a slightly different language. It's not exactly it's not exactly just primarily English, but it's like a weird dialect. We have all our own terms and words and things like that. And so we'll be uh, we already know that part, so we don't have to spend time in language school. In addition to that, the local language, as I said, my wife already speaks it. And then the missionary, a normal missionary, when they go uh, once they go back to the field, uh, they've got to f- learn the culture to figure out how to adapt teaching the gospel and bringing the gospel to the, local, to the local people. You see, a missionary's job is not to go and Americanize everybody. The missionary's job is to go and share the gospel with a culture that already exists. And so we already know that culture, the military side and the German side. And so we are, we've already got that part set up. Now, what normally happens is a missionary will, will go and plant a work by, by getting together a group for Bible study, and then that eventually like grows and becomes a church and they, the, the Lord raises up a local national and, and the pastor tra- or the missionary trains them to become the pastor to take over that work so that eventually it can stand on its own and the missionary moves on somewhere else. With military missions, it's a little different. There is no local national to raise up because their people are always in and out, in and out, in and out. So what happens is the missionary has to go and plant and work the field like a farmer does. Every year, a farmer has to go out and plow their field, and they have to plant new seed, and they have to water that seed and fertilize that seed, and, and then come back in the harvest time and, and harvest the, or reap the harvest. But next year, he, the farmer has to go back out and do the same thing again and again and again and again, and that's exactly the way military missions is. Every year, we have to be out every, all the time because... In three years' time, it will be a totally new group of 54,000 troops plus their families in that area. And during that, 50, during that three years, the military member may be deployed away for up to a year or more. At some point, they're going to get deployed away. So we have less than three years to reach these people. And our goal is to reach them with the gospel so that they can be saved first and foremost. If they are saved, or once they get saved, either one, they're saved already, I mean, then we want to disciple them 
to help them grow in their walk with the Lord. And then the third, the third goal is before they leave there, we want to put them in contact with a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church at their next duty station or back home or wherever they're going for their job if they're getting out of the military, whatever it is, so that they can immediately get plugged in and continue growing. Just like we did when we moved from place to place. We, we found a church, we got plugged in. But we had to find our church on our own. I want to up that by helping them already have that church in mind before they ever get to have them already in contact with people uh, and maybe even have those people help them getting, getting settled and acclimated to the new place. Imagine, if you will, you're a, you're a young military family. Uh, you may or may not have some young ones, and you go uh, get stationed in this foreign country or halfway around the world. You don't know the language. You don't know the culture, the laws. You don't know the money system. You don't know where anything is. And before you're even completely moved into uh, this place that, that you've been assigned to live, either on base or off base, and a lot of times it's off base in Germany, uh, and then your, your military spouse is deployed away. And now this young, this young wife or husband is left behind, maybe with young ones, and has no support. Doesn't know anybody, doesn't know anything about any, any, anything that's around, and they're left to fend for themselves. And that happens every day. And so we want to be part of their support structure. Our, my, my wife and I m mention often, our family is the military and the church family. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are closer, th and, and our military families are closer than our real families, our blood families. Because of this constant moving around, because of the constant the stress, the things that are going on. The military ministry, the mission field, is over 5 million souls. 5 million, that's the active duty guard and reserve personnel, that's the spouses of the military and the children of the military. Anybody in here a military spouse or was a military spouse? Two? Three. Thank you all for your sacrifice. Any military veterans in here besides me and the Marine back there? Which service? What branch? Army. Thank you. Ever been to Kaiserslautern? Been to Germany at all? How about in, anybody, any military kids in here? Did you guys sacrifice too in your life when, you're, when your parents were serving in the military? Yeah, you did. Thank you all. You might not have chosen it. You might weren't, may, may, not, may have been forced upon you, but you still had to sacrifice. So thank you for that. Our job is to go and reach these same people just like you with the gospel so they can be saved. Amen. Uh, We're going to go and work alongside a missionary who's already there. Brother Gib Wood is his name at that church, Rhineland Baptist Church. And we are going to be starting up a single serviceman center dealing primarily with the single service folks but as an, uh, a greater outreach of the church, and that includes the families as well. Um, so pray for us in that aspect. Is, uh, the idea is that we would have a, a freestanding home, which is not very common over there, mostly apartment living or, or townhouses or something, um, where we can have service members over to our house. My wife can cook them a good home-cooked meal. Um, we can have Bible study, play games, just have a good home, away from home, to hang out uh, there. And then also at the church building, the church property, there is a singles room um, that is it's specifically for them that we, we have to be fixing up. It's, it's kind of in disarray. But uh, that's where we're going. That's why we're going there. Now listen. There are, as I said, five million souls associated with the military. And in that five million souls, there's over 50% of all first-time marriages end in divorce in the military. 
because of the separations, because of the stress, uh, because of things that happen and, and unable to deal with it, because of the lack of hope in Jesus Christ. There is a number, a disturbing number, uh, known as, it's 22 a day, suicides every day. That's one every 65 minutes. That means while we're here in Sunday school this morning, while we're here in Sunday school this morning, somebody associated with the military is going to take their life. Active duty or a military member or recently separated combat veteran. And the next hour during the church service, another one will. And while we're enjoying a fellowship meal afterwards, another one will. And every hour until we come back this evening for evening service, another one will take their life. And this evening while we're here for evening service, another one will take their life. In addition to that, the military spouses and children, the suicide rates are high too, one every day and a half. So while we're here today, there's a good chance that somebody that is a military dependent will take their life in suicide because of a lack of hope that's found in Jesus Christ. They don't know that there's a way out. They don't know that they've been forgiven for whatever it is. We didn't lose very many people in combat in the last couple of years. Last year in August, as you've all been looking at the news, and, and it's, it, we're reminded of what happened in Kabul when the, when the military went in to secure the airport so we could evacuate some Americans and evacuate some Afghan nationals who had been helpful to us. Some military folks went to work, not combat, to provide security. And that day a suicide bomber came and blew themselves up, injuring and killing a lot of people, including 13 American service members. One Army sergeant, one Navy hospital corpsman, and 11 Marines came to work and lost their lives. We have testimony from another military missionary that one of those 13 had a, a good testimony of being saved. So praise the Lord, that one's in heaven with Jesus. But that leaves another dozen that just came to work to make people safe, and they stepped off into an eternity in hell. They need to know. They need to know. The month before that, there was a training accident off the coast of California. Last year in July, a, a marine uh, amphibious assault vehicle went down off the coast of California and take down, I think it was eight on board. All of them lost their lives. Just a training accident. The month after August, in September, there was a helicopter crash that took out some, uh, it, it was a, I think it was a Seahawk, it took out some sailors. I think uh, five lost their lives. In January of this year, there was a Osprey crash in Norway. Uh, the Marines were training up in Norway, and there was a, a flying device known as an Osprey. It took out eight Marines. There was another one here this spring. Osprey crash it took out eight Marines. They just went to work. They weren't even going into combat, and they, they have now lost their life. And I can't tell you, other than that one of the 13 in August, I can't tell you if any of the rest of those were saved. So all of those that I just mentioned may be in hell right now because they needed to know about Jesus. But as bad as that is, more people took their lives by suicide associated with the military than all of those combined. And that is straight up because they didn't have any hope. When you're suicidal, you don't have any hope. Our military folks need to know about that. They need to know that hope in Jesus Christ. Amen?
tonight. Questions? Questions? Yes, sir. Oh, good question. Can we go door knocking? Can we go witnessing folks? Because my wife and I are I'm, we have military ID cards as retirees, we have access to the base. We can go on base. We can, do, uh, we can go reach folks where they eat, in the food court, where they shop, where they, where they work sometimes, uh, where they play with the you know, MWR, uh, morale, morale, welfare, and recreation stuff. And uh, sometimes we can go into housing. A lot of that, will, what we can do on base, will depend on the chaplain that is us now. We are out. We will be working outside of the military. The church is off base, um, so we have free, we can have the freedom to preach the whole counsel of God, the whole word of God. But the chaplain has a big influence on what an outside organization can do on base, and so if the chaplain views us as uh, competition or an enemy. They won't let us do much of anything, but we have access because we're retirees. We can still get on base, and we can still talk one-on-one -on -one with people. And as far as any events or anything like that, if the chaplain would see us as uh, an ally or someone who helps their ministry to taking care of their troops, then they open it up a, a little more. And so that's the way we try to approach it is we want to be their ally. But here's the thing about the chaplains. They have a very tough job, and they... They sit on a fence. They have to follow the rules of the military and they have to follow the rules of their faith. Those rules sometimes contradict. And there are chaplains that are primarily they're Catholic because they basically run the, cha the chaplain corps. Well, there's all flavors of Christian denominations. But there's also Muslims and Buddhists and Satanists and Wiccans, and now the newest one is atheist. I don't know how that works, but they have atheist chaplains. And so if I'm a young service member and I go to the chaplain for help, who's supposed to be there to help me, what am I going to find? There's not enough chaplains of all things that I could go to the chapel and find somebody who's going to tell me the truth. I might, but they're very few and far between. That's why it's so important to have somebody from outside that can, can understand it because we know the language and the culture and we've already done the military. We, we're very qualified, I guess you could say, to do this. Good question. Did I answer it? Other questions? Somebody, somebody ask a question. Somebody ask my wife a question. Yes, ma'am. Kaiser... Loud or Kaiser's Lautern. It's uh, in K Town. Most people know K A I S E R S L A U T E R N. Did I spell it right? Yeah. Uh, or La you can look up Landstuhl, L A N D S T U H L. That's where the church is in Landstuhl. You can look up Ramstein Air Force Base, you can look up the military. K-Town is, is what they call Kaiser Slaughter. Hmm? Yes, sir. Why, why did you decide to go there? Is it still open there? Is that a service? Or what happened? Um, there are a number of factors that played into it, but this is where the Lord is calling us. Um, the church that is there and the ministry that is there needs more help because it is such a large mission field for the military there, that being the largest concentration of American military outside the U.S. So that's the best place to go and reach the military. So here in the States, near a military base, you've got churches that exist that have you know, some locals and some military, and depending on how well they reach out to them, they can take care of things here in the States. But overseas, we don't always have that. What did I miss, honey? Did I miss, miss, miss telling them anything? Yes, sir. You, uh, are you in the military? No, I am, but I'm not. Military? Outside the base? Or are you in the 
Oh, good. I was the other thing I was going to mention when you asked your other question too. Also, um, a good portion of them live on base in military housing, but there is so many that there's not enough housing for everybody. So they live out in the villages, out in the uh, economy. So we will also be able to reach out and reach them in the villages. In Germany, we can place tracks in mailboxes. You can't do that here in the States, but we can just walk around. Like we went around on Saturday and put the things on the apartments, uh, the door hangers. We can go and do mailboxes like that in Germany. And, we, and they actually do that quite often. And so they'll put German and American so we don't know who's living there. So have, have, we, have I forgotten anything? I always forget something. Yes, yes. Um, the area that we're going to, it's, it's a long-term forward deployment, basically. And then they, from there, they deploy out to other places, military-wise. So you have the families that are left behind, and you have the, the military folks themselves. Once again, thrown into a foreign culture where they don't know. Now listen, the miss is, this is what I forgot, and I knew I was miss, forgetting something. Um, think about this. The military folks go all over the world. They are, if they are saved, and they are getting deployed into countries where we cannot send missionaries, but because they're, they're on military orders, they're there to do a military-specific whatever uh, mission, and they take the gospel with them if they are saved. And they will take the gospel. They're used to serving something greater than themselves. They're used to, that's why we're, that's why we're in the military ministry. Because we're used to serving something greater than ourselves. We're used to serving and following orders and moving around. But we go into places, and so this becomes a very fruitful ministry as people get saved in the military. We're catching them at an age, generally, when it's the first time they're really away from home. They're on their own for the first time figuring out who they are in life. And that includes their spiritual standing. They may have gone to church their entire life. They may never have stepped in a church. But for the first time in their life, they're having to make those things on their own. And so that's why it becomes a, such a fruitful time in ministry to reach these people. And then they take it wherever they go while they're in. Now think about when they get out of the military. What do military folks do when they get out? Well, if they're saved, a lot of them will go into ministry if, if they've served at all in the ministries. They will, they will get, become pastors, missionaries, evangelists, whatever, or just hardworking folks in church. But what else do military folks do when they come out of the military? They serve in law enforcement. They serve in... Uh, in government jobs, they go into politics, 
They serve as managers and owners of businesses. You look at our country and how bad our country is right now. And if think about if all of the people in those positions that I just mentioned, if they were saved and if they made decisions biblically, how much different things would be. And that is another reason why, that min- why this ministry is so fruitful because not only what we can do with them, for them and with them now, but in the future if they grow in Christ and they can have an influence on the darkness in this world. Amen? Yes, ma'am. They're not. That's why military missions is so important. Um, There used to be when you went in the military, they would give you a little Gideon's pocket New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs. It was available if you wanted it. And pretty much when you go through basic training or boot camp, there's a chapel available, but you may or may not be able to get to go to it. And then like I said, you don't know what you're going to find when you get to the chapel. And that's your only access You can't go off base to church while you're in training. And then, everything, the focus is on the mission. The training and the mission. Anything you want to do for yourself, you have to try to make and find time. And you're really kind of discouraged from doing that. Because, well, mission first, mission first, mission. We've got to get this done, we've got to get this done. And that's the way we worked. Like I mentioned, I was gone all the time. I worked many, many hours. But I still... Once I was saved, well, I still made time for church, made time for serving the Lord. But no, they're not. That's why we need military missions everywhere that there's military. Good question. Yes, sir. Um, they have to keep the big, big thing, and it's no different than anybody else. The, their focus has to be on the Lord. Because they're going to get in places, and they're going to get in situations where they're going to, like I mentioned, for the first time, make decisions on their own. They're, look, it's worse than going to college to join in the military. They, they want to go out and they work hard, but then they play hard. And they want to go out and do things. And if you've ever been around a military base, look at what's around the outside of the military base. Places that we don't even want to mention in here. People don't want to, should not want to get involved in those things. But if you have no biblical basis to keep you there, or to keep you from going there, I should say, then you will. Go ahead. Last question. We have to. Uh, pretty good. But if you have more questions, make sure you count with him. And come on Christmas break. And uh, and only you pray for and submit that question and the state of work. Uh, I think it was just a comment, but can it be short? Short? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time we've had together. Lord, thank you uh, for allowing, uh, Pastor, allowing us to come and and share the ministry that Claudia and I have to the military. Uh, Lord, please help us to do that. And Lord, for everyone else here, Lord, we pray that you would uh, speak to us from your word. 
this morning during the morning service. Please bless the time, and may everything we do be honoring and glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
countdown, the clock, and are we starting then? But no, don't worry about it. We'll start when we start the good old-fashioned Baptist way. Uh, so that's good. But uh, why don't we go ahead and start this morning. As we do, I'll invite you to join me in standing. Uh, we have some folks coming in from the lobby, so make way for them as they do. Make room as they find their way into their seats. And let's begin with singing this old hymn, At the Cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Sing it out. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would He devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, We are glad to have our pianists back, and we've been missing them. I told them I felt a little bit sad with just the guitar and, and the bass, and they said, no, 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 it wasn't sad, it was fine, but they're just trying to make me feel better. <laughs> but, um, but we sure appreciate them, and I'm glad that, uh, that they're back. Why don't we go ahead and continue singing this next song, Jesus Saves. We have heard the joyful sound. Sing it out. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, find the steeps and cross the waves, onward to Amen. 
Amen. Wonderful singing. Thank you so much. And the pastor is going to come lead us in our call to worship at this time. Once again, I give, want to give a warm welcome to everybody who's here, to our missionaries who are here visiting with us and ministering to us. And if you didn't, if you weren't here for the Sunday school hour, um, you missed out. And it, was, it was a great blessing to hear about um, just their time in the military. And, uh, and we're, we're going to hear more from them and their burden. And the, the reason we're having the potluck is so we can keep them around a little bit longer and get to know them a little bit more, even as we, as we uh, just spend some time together, hang out, fellowship, and, and talk. And then we'll have them back tonight. If you're joining us online, welcome as well. And if you have a praise or a prayer request or something that you'd like to put in there uh, or let us know about, put it there in the comments. We'll see those. And uh, we're just glad to have everybody here with us together. And uh, like I said, Pastor's going to come lead us in our call to worship from Matthew chapter 5. All right, let me turn to it. Not always this disorganized. <laughs> this sometimes. Amen. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter five, verse sixteen. I'll read the first verse. I'll read the first verse, and you can read the second verse, and we'll rotate down to to uh, to verse sixteen. But I'm still trying to find my place in this Bible. Bigger? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going Can I borrow on. your glasses too? All right. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth Henceforth, good for nothing but to be cast out and be trotted underfoot of men. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Blessed, blessed. Glorify your Father. Well, let's bow for prayer. Father, again, we thank you for this day, and Father, for the privilege that's ours to come into your house, and especially today that we've got a missionary. Father, we, we respect your call to full-time service, and especially for those that will go to a foreign country, outside our country, and Father, to preach the gospel. Thank you, Father, for those that give sacrificially for missions and a special gift, Father, that our missionaries to be blessed on the field and be supported. So, Father, we thank you for this day and pray, our Father, that you would lead and direct in all that's said and done. Father, may you be glorified and praised and honored in a, in a way that would be pleasing to you, our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, for the sacrifice upon the cross. 
So, Father, take control now. Lead and direct in all that's said and done. Father, we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All righty. Well, let's see here. Couple, well, one big announcement. Well, we'll do a few. Uh, like we said, we have a potluck after the service, so stick around. If you didn't know, if you didn't bring anything, no worries. Um, hang around and have some food and fellowship, and it'll be all good. Where There's always plenty to go around. Um, don't be in a rush to run off and uh, just stay around and, and uh, enjoy and, and uh, have some fellowship. And then we'll be back for the evening service as well with the missionaries, the Heppens, and uh, they'll be here with us tonight again. And uh, so uh, be sure to be back for that. Um, this Saturday, the Back to School Bash, and uh, we were supposed to, we've been building it up and announcing it and talking about it, we were supposed to have a big canvassing push yesterday, and then it rained all day. And uh, so we've got a good number of these door hangers left still, and uh, Brother Zeph has been telling me that whatever was left after, after our canvassing yesterday there's anything left, he was just going to get all the teens together, throw them in a the van, and just go spread them all over the area and make the teens do all the work. And uh, so, praise the Lord. They're going to do that, by the way. Um, but if you would like to take some as well, then, then by all means, go ahead and take them and try to get them to pass out um, as quickly as possible, as early as possible. We want to give the folks in our community a, a bit of a heads up so they can plan for their weekend. Um, not all of us actually plan our weekends, but some people actually do. And so for those people that do plan ahead in their lives, which is usually not me, um, sometimes. But for those, we want to give them a heads up before, you know, Friday or the morning of and say, hey, come. Um, so we want to get these out to the community as quickly as possible, as early as possible this week. And uh, so we'll take care of those. There are some maps, some areas. Um, that, that we can still cover, and like I said, a good number of flyers still. Um, we are planning to do a bit of the setup and stuff on, well, throughout the week, but primarily on Friday, we're going to have um, some of the bounce houses and things come in, and some of them are kind of large, and they take um, more than, than just me <laughs> to move around. Um, so we could, we could use uh, some, some hands on Friday afternoon ish if you're available um, we should we should have them by then and uh, we're, we're bringing them in from the from the base over in Albuquerque uh, but we should have them by by Friday afternoon and to get them kind of positioned and set up and and ready to go so that Saturday morning uh, we're ready and uh, it's going to be a great day um, like I said um, there is work for everybody to do if you say you know I, I don't know that I could help um, there's there's always some supervision that needs to happen of the kids, you know, up on the slides and the bounce houses and, and everything, the dunk tank and all that. And there's going to be some sharp darts um, being thrown, and we want them thrown at the balloons on the board and not anywhere else. Um, so we need some, just some, some people around to kind of help guide and organize and answer questions. And, and especially, uh, we need some adults, some parents who can be around um, to talk to the parents of the kids. The kids are going to be distracted. The kids are going to be running around wild. And we need the parents who are sitting there, um, maybe, you know, waiting, just waiting around for the kids. Um, we need our church family to be engaging them, um, talking with them, building relationships, and especially, if possible, sharing the gospel. Um, that is the purpose of the event, is to get the gospel out. We're using all the fun and activities as the hook, draw them in, um, but the purpose of it, and the main focus of it, is the gospel. And uh, so we want to be prepared for that. Um, so, so come and, and be ready to do that. If you say, I've never done it before, I don't know how to share the gospel, um, it's a good time to practice. And really all you need to do is tell them about how you got saved and, and what the church is doing in your life and how you're grown in the Lord and, and uh, what it means to you to be saved, to be a child of God, to be a Christian. And um, just, just come, and, and if nothing else, come and be friendly, and let them know that there's a friendly church here on Agua Fria Street in the south side of, of Santa Fe, 
um, that they can come and, and uh, just be a part of. And so it's an all-hands-on-deck event. And really pray that it doesn't rain all day. Um, now, last time they threw the hose up on the slides and made it a water slide, and that was great. So I guess it's all good anyways if it rains. We'll have the canopies up um, to give some shelter, but I don't think the kids mind too much. They were hosing each other down and throwing water balloons, and, and everybody was trying to climb in the dunk tank. So I guess if it rains, it's all good. Um, but just pray that it's, that it's a good day. Really pray that the Lord um, moves in our community and, and just draws people and that the Lord works through us. If it's just our work, if it's just our effort, um, we might have some fun. We might have a crowd, uh, but there really won't be anything permanent um, or spiritually relevant come from it. Um, nothing certainly that will matter for eternity if it's just us putting on some fun activities. I mean, the world does that all the time and probably better than we do it. The world knows how to put on an event, a party. They know how to have fun. And this is not about that. Again, we're using the fun to bring people in so that we can do spiritual work and warfare. Um, so I always go over time talking about that, but it's just um, something that will be good for our church and necessary. And, uh, and it's, been, it's been a burden on, on my heart, so forgive me if I, if I ramble on a little bit. But um, that is the big thing. Is there anything else coming up that I'm missing? Um, do we want to announce Wednesday or... Or are we just going to send Wednesday morning? Or are we just going to send an email? Just an email? No? Announce it. Okay. All right. I'm getting the signal. Um, there will be the, the funeral service for the Martinez family, for their nephew that, that passed away um, Wednesday morning here at 10 o'clock. And uh, there will be the reception. Is the reception here at 11? And then the, the, the graveside um, and all that at, I think, 1 o'clock. And so we can give you more details um, at the funeral. Um, it'll be in the program and all that. Uh, but if you'd like to come and just support the family, encourage the family, then 10 o'clock here on, on Wednesday. Um, so is there anything else I'm missing, Miss Jody? Okay, so for the reception... Not a full-on potluck meal or anything, but just finger foods. Um, some people like to bring the mini sandwiches and things like that, um, but just to help the family. And so if you'd like to bring anything like that on, on Wednesday, then that would be a blessing as well. All right, let's see. I think there's a couple of birthdays that we can celebrate. And uh, I think this week on our calendar, we had a couple of birthdays. And uh, you're both right here in the middle. So Miss Jennifer, go ahead and stand up. Miss Emma, I think you had a birthday as well. Um, Kathy had a birthday um, really a couple weeks ago, but, uh, but we didn't get a chance to sing. Kathy had a birthday. Um, who else? Jack had a birthday. He was out of the country. Um, so we've got all kinds of stuff to catch up on and celebrate and have a good time. I don't know if there's going to be cake or something for the birthdays out there, but there's dessert and it's, it's all good. The party, the whole potluck is for your birthdays. Can we say that? No. No. All right. Well, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. All right, any anniversaries? I didn't see anything on our calendar, but uh, don't want to miss anyone. Any anniversaries we can celebrate? All right, well, let's continue singing this morning. If you'll join us in standing, another beautiful hymn, The Love of God is Greater Far Than Tongue or Pen Can Tell. Let's sing it out on that first verse. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond
take our tithes and offerings, and then pastor will come and pray. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, um, we're so thankful for your love and so thankful for what you have done for us. And I pray that as we come as a church to just to honor you with, with your money, with what you have given to us, that you be pleased by our offering, Lord, that we may be able to, Lord, to remember and to acknowledge that um, you are Lord, that you're, you're God, that if, if something happens, it's by, by your will, by your grace. So, I pray that as we come as a church and we get our hearts ready for the service, for the message, that you prepare our hearts. I, prepare that you, I pray that you prepare our minds, that, Lord, that you help us to, to develop a heart, give us hearts of flesh, not hearts of stone, that so we may have a burden, a burden for others, a burden for our military, a burden for, for the people of Santa Fe. But we need of your grace as, as we minister, as we try to have some of the activities for be with us, Lord. We, we beg of you, we, Lord, uh, knowing that we do not deserve anything from you, but you're a good God who, who wants us to ask. And Lord, we pray for all of these. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, amen. You may be seated. Oh 
Good to see um, some faces we had not seen in a while. So welcome to church, and let me invite you to stay for our potluck. And uh, if, you know, this is a family, so we have more people than we have food. We can just split that. <laughs> and God, God seems to always multiply. I, I know that uh, Mrs. Cantu can tell you uh, how many times we thought, I don't, I don't know we have enough, and we always have enough. So, um, so if you're a visitor, let me just tell you real quick. I don't want to take more time from Brother Happening. Happen, like happening, but happen, right? I can say, I struggle with that. Gutierrez, I have no problem. <laughs> but uh, just let you know about missions, and if you're not, you don't come from a church that does missions, you may be wondering, what are they doing? Um, so... We do believe that God has given us a great commandment. We do believe that we are to, hear, to be here and to serve Him. He's worthy of our service. He's worthy of, a, of our time, or our energy, or our efforts. And, um, and we want to tell as many people as we can about the gospel. And this not only takes place in Santa Fe. And let me tell you, if you are not doing it around, uh, start doing it. Uh, you don't have to do it the same way. Not everybody has to be a preacher. Not everybody has to be able to. But we can all witness in one way or another. So, um, and we also do it all over the world through our missionaries. And thanks to the faithful offerings of the people at Santa Fe Baptist Church, we're able to support, support all those missionaries. And, um, and every once in a while, we bring new missionaries. Every year, we have about two or three missionaries that come back from the field. Um, some of them because they take churches in America, some of them because of, of death in the family, some of them for other reasons, but um, it's just like a church. If you're not reaching other people for Christ, if you are not renewing our emphasis on missions, eventually we become, uh, we used to be this, right? Uh, so we have Brother Heppen, and he's going to introduce the ministry, uh, the ministry of uh, you know, the military, reaching the people uh, all over the world that, that belong to the U.S. military. So we want to hear that, and uh, if you want to participate, you're welcome to do that. We do that, many of us, we do it through our offerings, and we have a faith missions program, and we mentioned that in January, but I just want to let you know what, what we're doing, what's happening, and uh, if you want to participate on Wednesday night, we will have a vote on that. But... Um, you're here for a treat, and we want to celebrate that. And sometimes we wonder, should we do potluck when every, a missionary comes? Because there's so much going on and add something else. Uh, but we try to do that because we want to make a party. We want to celebrate that somebody is going to the field. Somebody wants to go. Somebody uh, has a call to do it. So, um, so that's what we're doing. You know, maybe later on we will decide otherwise, but uh, for now on we want to celebrate, we want to, uh, we want to promote that, and we want to support them. So as you come to hear Brother Heppen come and preach, be praying, be praying not only for the message right now, but for what God will have uh, the Heppens do for him. Let's go to the Lord. Well, I'm going to open in prayer before him. So let's just welcome him, and he can pray, and he can open in prayer. Well, good morning again, everybody. Uh, if you were not here for Sunday School, my name is Gary Heppen, and with me is my wife, Claudia, and we are missionaries to the United States military and their families serving overseas in Germany. Um, we are headed to a place called Kaiserslautern, Germany, and it has the largest concentration of American military outside of the United States. All branches of service, I don't think I mentioned that before, we have all branches of service there, I think, except the Coast Guard, and that includes the new Space Force. There's some folks there as well, so uh, please pray for us as we go to work uh, to share the gospel with our military and their families uh, overseas. Um, let's get right into the message, and then I'll, I'll be showing our video uh, after I preach so that you... Uh, can get a better understanding of, of our the calling in our military. 
ministry. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 15, and also uh, find and put your finger in Luke chapter 15, and that'll make things go a little quicker uh, in a little bit, because we'll be, we'll be primarily in John chapter 15, and then we will go uh, right over to, um, to Luke for just a moment, and then come right back to John. Okay. Um, while you're turning there, I'd like to ask you a question. I always have this, this thing where I, I like to ask a question before I start preaching so that you have it running around in your head and kind of understand uh, part of where we're going. And so the question I'd like to ask you this morning is, would you like more joy in your life? And the answer to that question, uh, would you like more joy in your life, is the title to the message, which is, what I would hope your answer is, is more joy, please. More joy, please. Can you say that with me this morning? More joy, please. Now, I'm going to be asking that question randomly throughout the message to make sure you're paying attention. I'm going to preach as fast as I can so we can get over there to the food as quickly as we can. Uh, but if I think you're not, you're not getting it, I'll have to slow down or back up or, or whatever. So make sure you, you focus, listen for that question uh, so that I know you're still paying attention. I'm asking, would you like more joy in your life? I am not talking about happiness. Okay? Happiness is tied to the happenings in your life. Happiness is tied to the circumstances, the things that are going on in your life. And you can be happy one minute and the circumstances change and you'll be completely unhappy the next moment. In fact, those circumstances that we can all agree the last uh, couple of years have not been the greatest. And as we were talking with Pastor, uh, things just seem to be getting worse and worse and faster and faster. They're getting worse and worse, just like the Bible tells us that it will. But those are our, our circumstances. Circumstances can bring, you, uh, bring one person happiness and another person at the exact same circumstance bring them unhappiness or something other than happiness. And I'll, I'll try to illustrate what I mean there. Answer me this question, somebody. Who is the smartest man in the Bible? Anybody? Solomon was the wisest man in the Bible. Who is the smartest man? He's trying to be he's trying to be polite and raise his hand. Jesus, Jesus is God, so that's kind of cheating. Not really doesn't really count. Uh, But the smartest man. But thank you, that's a good answer. Not the smartest man in the Bible. I will tell you the name is. Abraham. Now somebody tell me why. He knew a lot. And there it is. Remember the point of the question was, see he's shaking his hand, he was in pain. Uh, The point of the thing was that a certain circumstance can bring one person happiness, and that would be those of you who chuckled and laughed, and the others, it brought pain. And that's the like pastor that groaned and moaned, and, and, and I don't think he might have broke his head. He was shaking his head so hard and broke his neck. But that's that's way, uh, by the way, dad jokes are designed to do, uh, to bring you kind of a both in one, and I've been limited to one per day by my children. That's all I was told I was allowed to say, one dad joke per day, so... Uh, moving on, so I'm not. I'm, I'm, that's that's happiness. It, it, that's not what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about joy. Would you like more joy in your life? Okay, I gave you one freebie, but I told you it's going to come randomly. All right, John chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Would you look with, with me, please? Uh, we're going to read just four verses. John chapter 15, verse 11, to give you the background of what's going on. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. Judas Iscariot has already gone off to betray him, and he is with the remaining disciples, giving them some instructions before he goes off to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And then there he will be betrayed, taken off and beaten and scourged, and then uh, brought to the cross to be killed uh, shortly thereafter. And in the, he is giving these instructions to the disciples. And in John chapter 15, he's talking about the fact that he is the true vine, and we are the branches, and that we're supposed to bear fruit as Christians. We're supposed to be bearing fruit, and therefore God will be, uh, God will be glorified, and that people will know that we are His disciples. And then we come down to verse 11. Jesus speaking says, These things have I spoken unto you, 
that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Let's pray, and then we'll get right into the message. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you this morning for this time. Lord, I thank you for these people who have come into your house to worship you, Lord. Lord, they worship you with their song, they worship you with their prayers, uh, they worship you with their giving, and Lord, now allow them to learn from your word. Lord, please open every ear to hear and every heart to understand. Lord, as we take a look at this passage and what it says about joy, and Lord, I pray that they would uh, understand and that we would understand and be, and be asking you for more joy, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Four points, just four points out of these four verses about this topic of joy. So Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says in this verse 11, he says, these things have I spoken unto you. So there is a reason that he is talking to them. In fact, if you read through this kind of passage he says this phrase these things have I spoken unto you that but something uh, several times between verse uh, chapter 14 and 15 and 16 he says it several times but in this particular passage he says these things have I spoken unto you uh, that my joy might remain in you and so this first point is Jesus's explanation Jesus's explanation in verse 11 and uh, he's telling us that he he is he's been to- telling the disciples some things and the, the reason that he's telling them is for this thing called joy, that his joy would remain in them. And so for us to understand, I've told you what joy is not, it is not happiness, but for us to understand what joy is, we need to understand, or how to get it, we need to understand exactly what it is first. And so we need to know why, what Jesus is joy, because it says my joy in, would remain in you. So what was Jesus' joy? Was, was it to come and preach and then be rejected? That sounds pretty joyful, doesn't it? That happened to Jesus. Was it to come and uh, heal people and do wonderful miracles and then to be lied about and falsely accused and plotted against? That also happened to Jesus. Was it to be beaten and executed? All these things, you see, they all happen to Jesus. But they are all happenings. They are all circumstances. They are all the situations in life that Jesus had to go through. In Hebrews 12, 2, the Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, and despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he did die on the cross for this joy, but what was the joy? That's why I had you put your finger in Luke chapter 15. Keep your finger now in John 15, because we're coming right back. But looking over in Luke chapter 15 now, uh, Jesus is gathered, and and the publicans and sinners have drawn near to hear him, and they they had a meal, and the Pharisees and scribes are murmuring, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, here's that word again, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I, Jesus, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light the candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying... Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy 
in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to preach this message this morning, and I went out yesterday with, with Pastor and hung some door knockers and drove around in the car with him, and I don't know how many times I heard him say that very verse, that there's joy in heaven over a sinner that repenteth. And I said, okay, God, I get it, that we're going to have this message today. Well, you see, Jesus is telling this, this uh, parable, and he is saying that there is rejoicing over something that is lost being found. And the root word, if you can't guess that from the English, the root word of rejoicing is joy. And then he tells us that the, the lesson that we're supposed to learn in verse 7 is that there is joy in heaven over one person that repents. Now where is Jesus right now? This, this is not a tough question. He is, I just read you Hebrews 12, 2 a minute ago. He's at the right hand of the throne of God, right? He's in heaven. There is rejoicing in, or there is joy in heaven when somebody repents. And then in verse 10, he says that there is joy in the presence of the angels. Not that the angels have joy, but there is joy in their presence. Well, where are they? They're in front of the throne of God, ministering to God, ministering to Jesus. And so there's joy in heaven where Jesus is. There is joy in the presence of the angels where they are right in front of him. And I submit to you that the joy that Jesus died for on the cross is the joy that comes when a soul is saved, when a sinner repents. Would you like more joy in your life? Okay, strap in. We're getting ready to go right, right to it. Here we go, back to John chapter 15. So the joy is Jesus that Jesus has is souls being saved. In fact, he said himself in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He died for this joy. Now if you're in here tonight, today and you're a parent, or, or it doesn't even have to be a parent, just somebody who has done something for somebody else strictly out of love. You have done it just because. Do you get uh, more enjoyment out of the person appreciating what you did or them rejecting what you did? Appreciating, right? That's, I mean, this is, hey, I'm not a hard preacher. There's not a lot of tough <laughs> trick questions in here, okay? We, 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 we have a tendency to be uh, responding better when somebody appreciates what we've done for them. Jesus gets joy when somebody appreciates what he did for them on the cross of Calvary, when he died for your sins and mine. That his joy is seeing souls saved, and that starts with you when your soul, when you get your soul saved. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, I'll get right back to that. But also back now in John chapter 15, verse 11, he says, These things have I spoken unto you that, he's, notice he says this, my joy, Jesus' joy, might remain in you. So the joy that we're going to get is this joy that comes from Jesus. And he goes on in that same verse and he says, my joy might remain in you and that your joy, all in one, one breath, he went from it's my joy, it's going to stay with you, and now it's your joy. My joy, Jesus' joy, stays with you, and it's your joy. Would you like more joy in your life? That your joy. And then also notice he says, your joy might be full. You see, when Jesus, and when God gives us a blessing, he doesn't want to give us piecemeal blessings. God wants to give us blessings so that we are full, so we know that God was the source of the blessing. It doesn't, that's just a little bit. God wants to give us blessings that, that cause us to be full. Our cup is full. It's shaking together, packed down, and it's still running over. And that the, the windows of heaven are opened up and the blessings are poured out so that there's not room to receive it. There's so much. Hey, by the way, if God's given you enough uh, blessing of, a, of enough joy that it, there's not room for you to receive it, that means you're supposed to be giving some of it away. Some of that joy, some of that love, some of that peace, all of those things. You need to be giving those to others as well. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy 
might be full. Now that we understand what joy is and where it comes from, let's figure out now how to get it. Point number two, point number one was Jesus' explanation. Point number two, Jesus' commandment. Look at verse number 12. This is my commandment. I'm a military guy. There's a few other military uh, folks in here. A commandment is not a suggestion. It's not a guideline. It's not a good idea you might want to think about on months that have five Sundays in it when we're doing something special in the church. It's a commandment. It's an order. We have been ordered to do something by God, by Jesus Christ. And so this is Him speaking. This is my, Jesus' commandment. In the military, when, when uh, you're given an order and you don't follow it and, some, and an order doesn't get followed, at the very least, somebody's getting in trouble. At the worst, somebody could die. And in this case, it's the worst. Somebody could die if you don't follow his commandment. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is ordering you, ordering me to love others the way he loved us. So how did he love us? He loved us unconditionally. He loved us sacrificially. And there's a third point. He loved us with a purpose. Purposefully. He loved us with the purpose of souls being saved. That's why he loved us. That's why he came and died on the cross. So we could be saved. Sacrificially giving of ourselves for others for the purpose, and not just randomly giving, but ra- giving to the purpose so that they can be saved. In John 13, 34, he said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. If I had to be given an order twice in the military, either I wasn't paying attention the first time, or it's very, very important. Think about it here. Parents, you have kids, or those of you who uh, used to be kids, who are now older, if your parents had to tell you more than one time something, it was, it was important, wasn't it? Don't touch that stove, it's hot. Don't take candy from strangers. Don't get in any strange cars. Don't play in the traffic. Why did they have to tell you that more than once? It's very, very important. Not because they're trying to be mean, because they're trying to protect you. There's something very important going on here. We have to love others the way Jesus Christ loved us. We are being ordered to do that. To love others unconditionally. To love others sacrificially. To love others with the purpose of them being saved. Amen? Point number three, Jesus' illustration. We had Jesus' explanation. We had Jesus' commandment. Now we have Jesus' illustration. He says in verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He is demonstrating, he's talking about what he's about to do on the cross. This is going to be a demonstration of his love when he lays down his life on the cross for us. Why? Why? Because the Bible also tells us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every one of us in here and everyone who's listening online or watching online or who will watch it and listen to it later, anybody who can hear me speaking right now, it doesn't even matter if you can't hear me speaking right now, all of us in the entire world, past, present, and future, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. If the wages of sin is death. The payment that is due. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth or demonstrated His love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, unconditionally, Christ died for us sacrificially so that we could be saved. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever, that's your name, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be, not might be, not could be, shall be saved. You see, He died on the cross for us so that if we would accept Him and call upon Him, that we would be saved. There's no other way we can do it. No other person we can call upon. Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We can't earn our way or work our way there either. Ephesians 2.8.9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and it not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Because see, if I could earn my way there, uh, and, and I figured out how to do it, and I would get there, and then I would say, I, I, I made it. And Christ didn't need to die on the cross, because I could do it on my own. But I can't, because the Bible says I can't, and the Bible says that Christ had to die for our sins. And if you're here this morning, and there's not a time in your life that you can point back to and say, yep, I accepted what Christ did on the cross. I asked Him to forgive me. I repented of my sins. And I accepted Him. And He saved me. And I know for sure, 100%, absolutely beyond a shadow of doubt, I'm going to heaven. If you haven't done that, you need to get that right today before you leave this place. We're not promised tomorrow. That verse said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and I said whosoever means you. That's the same whosoever that shows up in John 3.16. Because God sent His Son to die. That whoever, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But here's the warning. If you don't decide to accept Him, that same whosoever shows up in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 15, for whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Because if you didn't accept him, the wages of sin is death, and that's the death. You need to get that straight before you leave here today. I talked in Sunday school about some soldiers and sailors and airmen who, who died and potentially stepped into hell. That could be you. They didn't go to, these ones I was talking about didn't go to combat. They just went to work. You could be leaving here. And it could happen to you in an instant. And you find yourself being cast in the lake of fire. We don't want that for anybody. So, before you leave here today, if you haven't, get, then get that right. Point number four, Jesus is a requirement. In John 15 and 13, he said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus demonstrated he was our friend because he laid down his life for us. Would anyone in here like to be his friend? Look at verse 14. Ye are my friends if... There's a requirement there. Jesus is a requirement. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I have commanded you. What did he commanded us? He, I, I just went over it. I told you this wasn't hard. He commanded us to love others the way he loved us. Unconditionally, sacrificially, and with the purpose of souls being saved. It's that simple. Would you like more joy in your life? If you want more joy in your life, here's how you get it. You follow Jesus' requirements. If you love me, it says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments to love others. Now, if you just think, hey, I just pulled this passage out of context and it doesn't really say that, you put it back in context of John chapter 15 of us being the branches of the vine, which is Jesus Christ, and us bearing fruit so that souls can be saved. That's what he's talking about on all of this. And right before this part of the passage, he talks about, again, it talks about love and commandments in verses 9 and 10 before he gets to verse 11 where he's talking about joy and then he talks about commandments and love again. And then he continued down and he talks about it more. In fact, in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. In other words, Israel at that time, had, they had had times where they had good rulers, they had good leaders, they had had a good economy, they were doing well, and yet still they didn't have more joy. 
the verse continues and it says, they joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And then in chapter 12, verse 3 of Isaiah, it says, therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. So the joy that Jesus has his soul's being saved. In Acts chapter 8, Philip is in a certain city. In verses 4 through 6, he's preaching the gospel and people are being saved. And verse 8 says, And there was great joy in that city. Would you like more joy in your life? Here's how you get it. You participate in ministries uh, that lead to souls being saved. If you're here this morning and you're saved, think back to when you got saved and the joy that you experienced at that moment. To know that you were no longer bound for hell. To know that your sins were forgiven and that Christ had died for you and you were bound for heaven. And you had that joy. Now, think about it. Has anybody in here ever led somebody else to the Lord? One, two? Just two people? Three, four, five, six, seven? Oh, a few more. This is something you can be proud of because you're boasting in the Lord. Okay? Pride is not normally good, but you can be proud of the fact of leading somebody to the Lord. Think about when you led that person to the Lord. Did they experience joy? Yes, they did. Did you experience joy because you got to be part of God's plan of seeing them saved? Yes, you did. Did you play I've Got a Secret? After they got saved and you had joy and they had joy and you guys just kept that to yourself. Or like the people in Luke chapter 15 that we just read about, did you come back and say, Pastor, guess what? So-and-so got saved. Hey, I'm going to do it. We went out yesterday passing out those little flyers. And we stopped at this apartment door that was open and pastors started talking away. At this young man, Anwar. Anwar. Anwar got saved. He got joy. Pastor got joy. I got joy. And I'm telling you about it. We're all going to get some joy because somebody got saved. God's still in the saving business. That's what we're here for. If we didn't have to be part of this, we would just get saved and poof, we'd be out of here and gone to heaven. But we've got a job to do. Our job is to share the gospel with other people. Loving them unconditionally. Sacrificially. Sacrificing of our time and our treasures and our talents so that people can get saved. So you bring that information back to the church and you share that somebody gets saved and we all get some joy. Jesus gets it first because... Somebody got saved, and then he leaves it with us, and we get the joy. So how do you get it? Well, number one, every time these doors are open, that is an opportunity to outreach with the gospel. I just shared the gospel with you. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, please, in the time of invitation in just a moment, have, take the time to do that. Take the time to come to Jesus Christ so you can be saved. But this, every time these doors are open for a, a service, whether it's a normal Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, be here. If it's a special meeting, be here for that. Anything that the pastor asks you to do, that he's been called, uh, led of the Lord to do, that is an outreach to people, you should participate in it if you want more joy in your life. Because you'll be part of the ministry that is seeing souls saved. You're sacrificing. Brother Ben said... Please pick up some of these flyers and take them and get them out of here and pass them out. Because we're having this event where the sole purpose is what? So we can dunk the pastor in the dunk house? No. It's so that we can share the gospel with people. So participate in that. We need to get the flyers out of here. We need some people to set stuff up. Brother Ben said we have stuff going on. Anytime something else comes up with the church that there's an outreach of something to do, you should be participating in it, sacrificing of your time, talents, and treasures so that it can be done, so that souls can be saved, and you'll have more joy in your life when those souls get saved. Out there are some tracks, gospel tracks somewhere, right? There's some back there. I think there's some out there. Somebody sacrificed of their time, talents, and treasures to get them printed and sent to you so they can sit there and collect dust. No. So you can take them out of here and put them in somebody else's hands so they can see the gospel, read the gospel, and potentially be saved. And you'll have more joy. You're participating in that ministry. 
on the back wall, there's all those missionaries that you guys support already. And on that side, there's these prayer letters from those missionaries. How many of you have taken the time to stop and read over those missionary prayer letters? And by the way, they're called prayer letters because you're supposed to be praying for us. And the one thing I guarantee you that is in those prayer letters is if somebody gets saved under a missionary's ministry, we put that in there. If somebody doesn't get saved, we'll put other stuff in there too. But the one thing for sure we'll get put in there is when somebody is saved. Why? Because we want you to be part of that joy. Because if you're praying for us, you're part of our ministry. If you're supporting us financially, you're part of our ministry. And you're participating in that ministry. And so when souls are saved under that ministry, you get joy. Jesus gets it. We get it. You get it. Would you like more joy in your life? Isn't it pretty simple? He gave us a commandment. It, it was an order to do this. And, be, and we also get to have joy out of it. Amen? Now, I'm here to tell you that as a missionary to the military, there are some friends that you have. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And he's, that made him, our, made him our friend. You have some other friends who are laying down their lives for you that you don't know. Every day. That's the folks associated with the United States military. The service members, their families, and their children, and their, their spouses and their children. They're laying down their lives every day for you. And they need to know about the one friend that they have that laid down their life for them. And that's Jesus Christ. Will you help us to go? Will you pray for us? If you'll pray for us, back there on, the, on our table is our prayer card on the anchor. If you hadn't got one already, please get one. That's so you can pray for us. On the back are some prayer requests for the military. You can pray for the military. Also on the table is a, a brochure, a pamphlet, how to pray effectively for missionaries, some specific ways you can pray for us to be effective in, in your prayers for us and for other, other missionaries, not just us. But pray for us. And if the Lord leads, support us. And you'll be part of our ministry. We'll be part of your ministry. Sharing the gospel, that's why we're here. Now let me ask you one last time and then I'll close in prayer and then we'll show the video. And then pastor after the video, I'm done and you can close as you see fit. Would you like more joy in your life? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you once again for allowing me to share your word. Lord, this, this concept of joy that starts with you. Lord, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us and for his shed blood. Lord, thank you that he came and he died and he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures so that we can have victory over sin and death and hell. Lord, I pray if there's even one person here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, there's not a time in their life that they can point to and say, yes, I accepted him and I know for certain that if I should die today, I'm going to heaven. If they don't know that, Lord, if there's one person, even one person, Lord, please let them be saved today. Lord, Jesus had 12 with him and one of them was lost. In the group this size, there's got to be somebody. You've sent them here to hear your gospel this morning and I've shared it, Lord. I pray that they would get saved. Lord, for the rest of us, we experienced the joy when we got saved. And Lord, we want to experience more joy. So help us to participate in ministries to see souls saved. Help us to recognize those opportunities and give us the words to say when somebody comes across our path that we need to share the gospel with. And Lord, that's everybody that we come in contact with. Just help us to do that, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We pray that you get all the glory for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, brother, if you'd play that video for me.
you want more joy in your life? Well, that was, I caught you by surprise. Do you, do you want more joy in your life? So let me ask you this question. And um, I'm not asking you to come here on Saturday morning. We need some help. I'm not asking you to get in this ministry. What I'm asking you, this is the call. How many of you will say, I want to serve the Lord. I want to reach more for the Lord. You know, and, and this is not just, sometimes we ask to raise hands. It's not that, who cares what other people think, but this is a commitment I want to do. How many of you said, today I want to commit myself to do this? How many will, will raise their hands and testimony, I will do this? I'm not asking you to do something in particular. I'm asking you, will you listen to God, whatever he has for you? I think that most of the hands here got up, and maybe all of them, I didn't see. There's something I have learned in my life that God is always calling, God is always speaking, God is always directing. Maybe you didn't have something in mind when I asked, will you raise your hand? Will you get involved in the ministry? Will you get involved, not necessarily here, but will you get involved serving the Lord? How many of you will then say, Lord, where? Where, Lord? We're going to have a moment of prayer. If you need to come to the front and talk to the Lord, here, this is the time. Some of you already know. Some of you already know where God wants you to serve. And, and we have a lot of excuses. We have a lot of excuses. Well, I, have, I have a lot to do. Well, welcome to the world. We all have a lot to do. But this is the truth. We always do what we truly want to do. How many of you come to the front and say, Lord, help me. Help me to do this. Help me to serve you. Help me to get involved. You need to do that. This is the time to unite your prayer between you and the Lord. Go and pray and ask God, where will you have me serve? And I'm going to have a question too. I think that most of you have heard the gospel before, but do you know? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know for sure if you were to die, where would you go? Do you know him? Do you know him? Some people will not understand why there will be such a joy to be saved. And I think that some of them don't know why there will be such a joy is because they don't know him. They have not experienced the joy of his salvation. You have not done that. Will you do that today? No one looking around. If you have never done that, will you raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want to get saved today. I heard the call. I understood what God wanted to do. I want to get saved. Anybody? As we pray, you need to come to your front and talk to the Lord about what He will want you to do, not what I want you to do. You can come to me for ideas if you need. But honestly, I want you to do what God has made you to do. So you need to come. This is the time. Just for a couple of minutes. We're not going to prolong this.
Dear Lord, um, we all need more joy. Lord, but many times we're not willing to surrender things. We're not willing to sacrifice. Lord, will you please give us a heart that desires to to see your will? Will you please give us a heart that that is truly seeking, Lord, your will, seeking joy and the joy that only you can give? The world promises a lot of joy, but it never delivers. So help us, Lord, as the church to come before you. Lord, I pray that as we have a, a moment of fellowship here at church, that you bless, that you bless the, the food, that you bless the people here. Lord, uh, we come as broken people in a broken world asking for more of you. So I pray that you work in our lives, you work in the life of the people here. We're going to be having some funerals. We're going to be having a lot of activities this week. Lord, we're in need of you. Lord, will you please bless be with the people here. Lord, be, be with our missionaries. And um, when I ask that you please just, just bless them as they're seeking to your will, provide according to your greatness, according to your riches. Lord, um, just, just be good to them. We pray for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before you go, I, just something real quick. I know that we have to go and everybody's ready. Wednesday, we're going to vote for Brother Heppen to um, whether we want to take him as a missionary or not. Um, and usually Wednesday, we don't have a big crowd, but I'm going to invite you. If you're a member of Santa Fe Baptist Church, why don't you come on Wednesday? It's only one hour. We do. I know that Sunday we go long, but Wednesday, we always stay within one hour, 7 to 8 o'clock, and we will include the voting in that. Um, if you want to, why don't you not a part? You know, many of you have never voted to take a missionary. You come on Sunday mornings. Um, but be a part, you know, be a part of that. Uh, this is not our church or their church. If you're a member of Santa Fe Baptist Church, this is your church, this is your commitment too. If you want to participate, Wednesday we will be voting for Brother Heppen. So um, I invite you to participate in this very important, um, very important act of our church. Okay, you're dismissed. Hope you have a, a good fellowship. And don't forget, Wednesday... At 10 o'clock, we have the service, and if you can bring some finger foods, we, we will appreciate that. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope it was a blessing. And if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. Finally, if you are wondering what it means to be a Christian or how you can become one, give us a call, communicate with us, and we would love to show you from the Bible how you can be born again. God bless you and we will see you next time.